Here are two great comedians, one famous, one forgotten. Charlie Chaplin became the best loved figure in the world, the other, for a while, the most despised. His name, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Arbuckle was once almost as popular as Chaplin. If he is remembered today, it is for a scandal which threatened the very existence of Hollywood and all but engulfed the film industry. was a comedian, one of the big ones, with Chaplin and Buster Keaton and that kind of thing, and he was a very big, he was an enormously fat man, and it was part of his act, the, the weight, fatness was part of his gags were written around it. Arbuckle had been in movies since the beginning. He was a pioneer comedy director. Fatty Arbuckle was considered extremely vulgar. Children loved him. It was Arbuckle who brought Buster Keaton to the screen. For all his vulgarity, Arbuckle had a quality of playful innocence. Audiences grew very fond of him. Mabel Normand and Roscoe Arbuckle played newlyweds in this Max Sennett comedy of 1916. Here, Fatty encounters the first example of his wife's cooking. The scene is played with a warmth and charm not often found in early knockabout comedy. Arbuckle's ability as a female impersonator caused as much laughter as outrage. Films like this, which he directed for producer Joseph Skank, were enormously successful. Well, 
he was like a brother to all the girls. We just loved him. He was a wonderful guy. There were many, many women that would jump at the chance of, you know, being Roscoe Arbuckle's girl. Arbuckle was soon a wealthy and respected public figure. He and Mabel Normand appeared in a promotional film for the San Francisco World's Fair. Mayor Rolf was proud to be photographed with these ambassadors for Hollywood, and such publicity helped to build up the good name of the industry. Hollywood needed it. From the beginning, there were forces in the land trying to give it a bad name. D.W. Griffith hit back with the satire of the Purity Leagues. They condemned leisure without effort as immoral. They were for closing the theaters and shutting down saloons. In 1920, the Puritans were triumphant. Prohibition became law. The sale of alcohol was banned. But prohibition failed to stop Americans drinking. You bought your liquor through bootleggers, and you prayed to God that you had a good one that wouldn't sell you wood alcohol, and you'd go blind. And uh, it was not unusual for uh, uh, a person to take any bottle out of a case of 12, open it, and take an ounce or two, and send it up to the pharmacy to have it analyzed to see if it was safe. So the old story goes that a man sent two ounces up to the pharmacy and a few days later, it came back, the report came back, sorry to inform you, your horse has diabetes. In Hollywood, social life centered on the Hollywood Hotel run by Mrs. Hershey. And I want to tell you, there was nothing that went on in that hotel that she didn't know about. <laughs> and everybody was scared to death of her. She but had an eagle eye and there was no on the, these dances, no drinking or anything like that. Nothing like that, just dancing, that's about all. And uh, believe me, it was a case of everybody back to their own room, too. The big night was on Thursday night. They used to clear the lobby, and we had a dance. And everybody used to look forward to that night. We were a bunch of kids making a lot of money, and uh, we didn't think so much about being elegant. I can remember among them was Fatty Arbuckle, who had a habit of putting a small piece of butter on his napkin, and then flicking it onto the ceiling of the hotel, which created a big round grease spot and uh, annoyed the landlady of the hotel no end. We'd go to the Ship Cafe or the Sunset Inn, whichever happened to be popular at the time, and that was our night to howl. <laughs> Jack Pickford and myself, we used to be thrown out of the roller coaster almost every Saturday night because he'd stand on his head and I'd stand up yelling and screaming. We, we thought that was fun. Well, we didn't know what to do with anything. We'd never had anything or any money. And here we were right in the center of this goldfish bowl with everybody beginning to look at us. <laughs> Prohibition drove people to hold private parties behind closed doors. Roscoe Arbuckle was celebrated for giving parties of the slightest excuse. But he had good cause for celebration. He'd been signed by Adolf Zukor of Paramount to a contract for a million dollars a year to make features like this one. It was called The Life of the Party. Thank you. 
September 1921. Despite a post-war recession, Hollywood's confidence ran higher than ever. At the end of another working week, the studios are closing up and the workers going home. Viola Dana leaves the Metro Studios to film night shots in the grounds of Roscoe Arbuckle's mansion on West Adams Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Arbuckle returns late that evening. Now, Kinsey said, I have to go up to San Francisco. I can't tell you why. But uh, he said, for God's sakes, don't die on me. And we thought that was very funny, very strange. Thought nothing of it until the next day, the papers. Arbuckle was accused of murdering a girl in a San Francisco hotel. The scandal reverberated around the world. That same weekend in London, Charlie Chaplin was receiving a hero's welcome. He was asked about the scandal in San Francisco. I simply cannot believe it, he said. I cannot believe Roscoe had anything to do with Miss Rapper's death. We went in those days up to San Francisco. People hadn't yet learned to go to New York, and there was no airplane. It took you four days to get there, and that wasn't what we wanted to do. So San Francisco was our playground from Hollywood. Everybody went to San Francisco. At the St. Francis Hotel, Arbuckle had taken over three rooms for a Labor Day party and invited a group of girls, including Virginia Rapp. Virginia Rapp had adopted the screen name of Rappé, but she hadn't worked in pictures for some time. This girl, I wouldn't call her a tramp, but she was an extra girl that made her way as best she could. And she had a habit of taking off all her clothes, prance around, <laughs> see what trade she could drum up, I guess. And in those days, that was quite something. Of course, today, you wouldn't even notice it. As well as girls, there was plenty of bootleg liquor. Uh, they got to drinking pretty heavy. What had happened to Virginia Rapp, she uh, had trouble, and her doctor told her she should never drink. But, you know, like on a party, she, got, she drank a little too much, and so she uh, uh, got sick. The story seemed clear enough to the news editors. Arbuckle had dragged Virginia Rappe to his bedroom at the height of a riotous and drunken party. He had locked the door, and despite her pitiful screams, he had brutally raped her. Four days later, she died of a ruptured bladder. She had been brought to the party by Maud Delmont, who now accused Roscoe Arbuckle of murder in a series of statements to the press. Arbuckle realized he was in trouble. He drove to San Francisco in his new limousine and posed for the press outside the Hall of Justice. His car was later seized for carrying liquor. His accuser, Maud Delmont, was a shadowy figure better known under another name. Oh, Madam Black, they called her. Uh, and she would get girls, you know, for parties. And she ran a badger game. She'd get these young girls and get them on parties and have them uh, claim that a producer or director tried to rape her. And uh, they'd shake them down. So the district attorney grabbed her and said, look now, uh, if you don't testify that it's Arbuckle's fault, we'll railroad you. <laughs>
To his public, Arbuckle was no longer a figure of fun, but the sort of vicious criminal he played in a nightmare sequence in one of his early pictures. He did and he didn't. was really blown out of all proportion, I realize now, by the man who was the district attorney who was running again for office. And this was a great platform for him. In prosecuting a star, district attorney Matthew Brady sought stardom for himself. This is first degree murder, he said. We don't feel a man like Arbuckle can pull stuff like this in San Francisco and get away with it. With Arbuckle in jail, the press wanted photographs. They faked them. Newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst seized the chance to boost circulation. The Arbuckle affair served his purpose in other ways as well. Well, I think Mr. Hearst, he was probably instrumental in wanting the uh, motion picture industry in Northern California, and instead it settled here in Southern California. And I think probably that was part of the motive of crucifying Arbuckle. Has presented his version of Beauty and the Beast. Every detail they could find was fit to print. One of the things that they condemned, they called very cruel, was when we'd be at a nightclub or anything, and we'd be with a date, you know, being very elegant, and Roscoe might come in at the same time, and he would, he had a trick of throwing our feet out from under us, and we'd fall, but we'd land on his stomach and never get hurt. We thought, we thought that was very funny. That was just one of those tricks. But this came out in the papers as a, showed the cruelty of the man. The press printed rumors as fact. The most persistent, supported by photographs like this, was that Arbuckle had committed the rape with a bottle. Ironically, in the life of the party, Arbuckle had played a district attorney fighting the milk trust. Aftermath of Arbuckle's party. Trial by newspaper, condemnation from the public, and soaring newspaper sales. The newspaper publicity killed him dead at the box office because even the denizens of the smallest, most obscure movie town in the world, they would have nothing to do with it. They wouldn't let their, even their children see it because that was that horrible monster who crushed a girl to death in his bestial passions. Women's groups across the nation rose up in fury. Arbuckle had hardly set foot in the police court for the preliminary inquiry when women stormed the place. But Brady realized his star witness, Maud Delmont, the woman who had started it all, was unreliable. He kept her away. The judge reduced the murder charge to one of manslaughter. At the trial, Brady produced two other witnesses from the fatal party. He forced them to perjure themselves. He also suppressed a doctor's report that Virginia Rappé had not been attacked in any way. Neither was she the virginal paragon the district attorney had suggested. She had had several abortions and suffered from venereal disease, which Arbuckle did not contract. 
When Arbuckle took the stand, he impressed the jury with his straightforward account. The majority favored acquittal. One member insisted Arbuckle was guilty. A friend of Brady. She hid her face from the press. In Hollywood, the studio heads were horrified that Arbuckle was not acquitted. They wiped their hands off him. Adolf Zuko had already stopped his salary. Now he put a total embargo on all his films. I asked Joe Skank if I couldn't appear as a, a, a witness, a, a, what do they call it, a character witness, because I knew Roscoe so well, and he was a darling man. And they said, oh, no, Vi, we can't let you get into anything like this. I said, well, gee, it just seems terrible that they can accuse this man of this horrible thing when all we all know so much better. All the girls here, he's got, he's like a big brother to us. At the second trial, Arbuckle was confident, but again, the jury was undecided. The case, however, was now overtaken by another sensation. William Desmond Taylor, a respected director, was murdered. The newspaper suggested the pattern of Taylor's life, dope and women. When you throw into one small town and one small business or art or industry or whatever it was, the people who can impress the world with their drama, with their sex appeal, with their lovemaking, with the, all of the big emotional, dramatic things that can happen, and put them all together in one little bowl, and you're gonna have some explosions. I'm oh. surprised we had so few. There'd been one too many for the small towns across America. There was a growing resentment at the get-rich-quick extravagance of the movie colony. They made their anger known, clean up Hollywood or close it down. The whole country was up in arms about it, and it was then the finger was pointed at Hollywood as being this terrible city of sin. I remember hearing, I think it was Louis B. Mayer, said something about if this keeps up, there won't be any more motion picture industry. They felt so precarious about the motion picture as an established art that they thought there wouldn't be any more motion picture at all, industry, theaters, anything. So they formed the Motion Picture Producers Association and decided to find a czar who would be able to decree what should go in films and who should be in them. In panic, the producers turned to Washington. From the cabinet of President Harding, they selected the Postmaster General, Will H. Hayes. Out of the headlines now was the result of Arbuckle's third trial. He was acquitted. The jury reached their decision in just one minute. They added an extraordinary statement. Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel a great injustice has been done him. We wish him success and hope that the American people will take the judgment of 12 men and women that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. Everything was proved in his favor, but the people put a burst bladder against his enormous weight and said, yeah, we know what really happened. The first public act of the industry's new leader was to banish Arbuckle from the screen. It, it broke him broke his heart and he was so clever that darling face you know like a big baby it was a moon face so it was it was a crime what they did to him just broke his spirit his heart and everything Arbuckle had been offered as a sacrifice but it was not enough the great cleanup had to begin
Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments seemed to many an allegory of recent Hollywood behavior. The worship of false gods. Something had to be done. Mill, of course, condemned such sinful acts, but first he showed them in loving detail. Then he brought on the great leader to mete out retribution. The producers had chosen to follow the same pattern. Photoplay magazine greeted Will Hayes as a mail order Moses. He was paid $100,000 a year, his job to reassure America. Above all, he told the producers, our duty is to youth. We must approach the job not merely with the viewpoint of men with millions of dollars invested in the business, but with that of parents with millions of children invested in it. Hayes announced he would pay close attention to the moral standards of Hollywood itself. They gave him a big banquet at the Coconut Grove of the Ambassador, and I was invited, and I sat at a table. And I was at a table somewhat in the rear, where I was able to see that some of our foremost stars of the day were imbibing pretty strongly out of what looked to be teacups, but it wasn't tea, because of prohibition. And so they were rather boisterous and carrying on, and a couple of them had to be carried out. And at the same time, Mr. Hayes failed to observe that and was making a marvelous speech about how beautiful he had found Hollywood to be and how he intended to maintain it and how he intended to keep it completely sober and, and uh, would do everything possible to give the public faith in the soundness of Hollywood and the movie makers. And meanwhile, literally, there were people being carried out of the hall. When Hayes toured Hollywood, the situation was desperate. The box office had slumped. Banks were refusing money to finance pictures. The producers were willing to surrender their power if Hayes could only save their industry. What the world needs, said Hayes, is more human and heartwarming pictures. Hayes seemed quite human himself. His engaging personality endeared him to picture people, but they recognized his authority. They called him the Tsar of all the Rushes. Hayes proved himself a master of public relations. He announced to the world that Hollywood could stay. That seemed to appease everybody and in, in every contract was a morality clause. If you were naughty and got in the papers, why then your contract was cancelled. Hayes demanded the studio head show more responsibility. The studios, in turn, exacted a feudal obedience from their stars. A studio, in effect, is a small principality with the vice president in charge of production being the prince. One of the subjects at the Paramount studio, a top box office star, was Wallace Reed. He exemplified the clean-cut young American. An actor of charm and talent, Reed was a first-class athlete. He was a favorite with the public and a favorite with Will Hayes. But he had a grim secret which no one knew, no one but the studio doctor. A studio doctor is a member of the studio company. 
He goes where he's told. He does what he is told. Now that means everything from an injection of a forbidden drug to an abortion. And all things in between. In 1919, Reed played the lead in a film called Valley of the Giants. On location, he was injured in a train crash. The picture was nearly finished, but there was no way of shooting around Wally. He just had to be had. So the company, not wanting to lose the investment entirely, sent a doctor with an ample supply of morphine to the location where he injected Wallace to the extent that he could feel no pain whatsoever, and he was able to finish the picture. But after the picture was over with, Wallace Reed was thoroughly hooked on morphine. Normally, he could have been sent to a sanitarium, to a cure, to something. But he was altogether too good box office. There was too much more to be gotten out of Wallace Reed. So in order to keep the services of this most popular of popular leading men alive, they kept him supplied with more and more and more morphine. On the screen, Reed's charm was undiminished. But by the time he made this film with Gloria Swanson, he was an incurable addict. If you're young and innocent and frightened of that kind of thing, um, I didn't want to be around a person, and I happened to be in a picture with Wallace Reed. And I, I, he wanted to drive me down location once, and I said, no, thank you, I have my own car. Mm -mm. And, it, you know, I was just maybe exaggerating the whole thing, and, and the fact that he may have had some inclination that way, what had that to do with me? Reed's addiction soon became an open secret in Hollywood. The fact that something was wrong also became apparent to his fans. An assistant on Reed's last picture was Henry Hathaway. Well, he came, he was late one morning, they went to the dress room and they, and they, they hustled him down to the set and Wally Worsley was the director and he sort of fumbled around the set and bumped into a chair and, and then, then he finally just sat down the store on the floor and started to cry. Reed entered a sanitarium. He died on January the 18th, 1923. Reed's widow made a crusading film about the drug menace, Human Wreckage with Bessie Love. Hayes gave his support. <laughs> Hayes knew that drug taking in the film colony was not uncommon. He feared another scandal far greater than the one that brought him to Hollywood. Dope was no stranger to Hollywood, nor to the any place in America in my early days either. First party I went to, crowded, we drank booze. It was during Prohibition, but that didn't matter. I didn't drink grappa or anything that happened to be going. And I went out in the dining room and the lights were off and in the middle of the table was a big glass bowl filled with little papers. I wonder what the heck this is. Which, true enough, was cocaine. <laughs> Hayes' task was to paint over all unsightly stains. He encouraged publicity shorts showing the stars as regular folk. 
Adele Rowland listens to her husband, Conway Turk. Alice Joyce and her husband spend a quiet evening at home. Marian Davis cleans her apartment. The fact that Miss Davis was mistress to William Randolph Hearst and lived with him in medieval splendor was not generally known at the time. Alma Rubens at home with her mother. Miss Rubens was actually a drug addict, and within a few years, she would be dead. The contrast between the outward appearance, the image that Hollywood tried to present of itself to the world, and the reality was simply tremendous. Uh, everything was very much under wraps, naturally. And nobody wanted to talk about it because uh, the, the, it, their careers depended on it. The magazines made the fame and glamour almost tangible. Their readers saw themselves on these covers. The whole idea of instant success was built up as part of the myth, part of the great uh, pink cloud that had been built around Hollywood, uh, because Hollywood had by then become the greatest single name in, uh, in geography. Hollywood was this tremendous magnet for very beautiful young people growing up all over the country. And there would be beauty contests all over the place, many of them actually organized by the studios, which I felt was a very cruel form of publicity, uh, where uh, the winner of the contest would get a uh, what was described as a contract with, uh, we'll say, MGM Studio or Fox Studio, or whatever it was. And there would be a, a tremendous excitement in their lives and the lives of the whole community. One of Will Hayes' primary concerns was the flood of girls to Hollywood. Ella Cinders was a modern Cinderella story. Colleen Moore brought this typical small-town girl to the screen. These girls from all over the country would, who had won beauty contests in little towns, and of course they knew, and their family knew, everybody knew they were going to, as in Ella Cinders, they were going to be a great, great star. Cinders leaves her small town for the irresistible lure of Hollywood. She leaves behind her friends, her family, even her boyfriend, played by Lloyd Hughes. Alice Cinders was basically a comedy, but a comedy with a message, for it showed just how hard it was to succeed in Hollywood. I 
could feel it so strongly because my dream came true. I know the broken little hearts that went home. Mrs. DeMille, um, who was very civic-minded, the first person who was, uh, she formed uh, the studio club where girls could uh, stay for very little and have board and room and be chaperoned properly. And then the city had to do something and they would take these girls because they would be stranded and give them a ticket back home to wherever it was. Oh, it was, it was a, a dreadful period because it was a shattering of dreams. The chances against a girl succeeding in Hollywood, said Photoplay, are 10,000 to one. People were really going hungry and in this gorgeous place, you know, with the sun shining down and everything so beautiful and the, all the glamour and everything at the same time, right down the street there were people actually going hungry. As desperate as the girls were the mothers who had come with them. I must say that it came very close to being procuring in many cases. This uh, rather hatchet-faced mother who was going around peddling the daughter and helping out uh, to make it possible for the girl to become a sort of really a high-class whore. I knew quite a few of those who eventually found this was the only way they could they could make out. And uh, they just settled for that. Some girls found work in stag films. These never reached the public screen. In 1926, with much publicity, Hayes opened Central Casting, an employment agency for extras. It would control abuses of the system. Girls would now be interviewed by sociologists, Hayes announced. Detectives would be put on studio payrolls. But in the first six months, out of 6,000 girls, only 30 got more than two days work a week. In Ella Cinders, the poor working girl becomes a big star, playing a poor working girl. Hidden from the film crew, Ella Cinders' boyfriend arrives unexpectedly. The film crew wonders what's going on. The boyfriend mistakes her costume for dire poverty and takes her home to happiness. Cinders had a haze ending, human and heartwarming. A fairy tale, with all the right ingredients for the family audience. But it is as a censor that Hayes is remembered. Yet, when he took office, his most urgent task was to fend off the local censor boards springing up all over the country. 
Each had its own degree of prudery, its own sensitive spot. In some states, you couldn't flash an ankle. In Pennsylvania, for instance, you daren't refer to pregnancy. Well, there was so much censorship, it's hard to tell where it begins. There was every polit political group in the country had a censor board. Every police department had a censor. There was a national censor. There was a state censor. I think that more people earned salaries as censors than all the combined motion picture people that ever worked in pictures have picked up. Just everybody was a censor. Buster Keaton had made his own comment on it all. Hayes stopped the censor boards up and down the country by assuring them, you don't have to do it, we'll do it. The idea of self-censorship was born and warmly welcomed by the producers. He put out a morals code, which the Motion Picture Producers Association agreed to, and the Independent Society of Independent Motion Picture Producers agreed to, and uh, we all wanted the chance to live. So we decided that we'd try to have somebody who censored the pictures before they were released and took out anything that was really censorable, that really shouldn't be shown. Cleavage. Oh, any suggestion of cleavage was out. Some of the things were really idiotic. A married couple is an example. Who you establish as married had to sleep 21 inches apart in twin beds. And we had some old leading men who couldn't make the jump in those days anyway. Fairbanks was the only one that got over. Hayes had a list of don'ts and be carefuls. Don't hold a kiss longer than three seconds. Be careful not to show women drinking. Don't show excessive violence. And don't mention illegitimacy. Not every director objected. Censorship makes you think. Well, all it does is make you guard your language, <clears throat> makes you express yourself in a wee bit different way, makes you smart enough to bypass this, make an audience see it well, without them actually seeing it. It just makes you three times sharper than you would be without it. That's all it does. Hayes was anxious to stop certain books and plays reaching the screen. When MGM made a film of Michael Arlen's The Green Hat with Greta Garbo and John Gilbert, they knew the story of an illicit love affair was on Hayes' blacklist. Director Clarence Brown had the task of suggesting the story without making it too explicit. He succeeded in the best Hollywood style, the art of arousing the audience without arousing the censor. Hollywood's self-censorship would last for 40 years. <laughs> 